this is not going to last. This is not going to last. This is not going to last. I had this recurring thought on my wedding day. You may think that would have been a good reason not to go through with it, but I decided to ignore that voice. Well, not exactly to ignore it, but to file it away for later. It wasn't because of all the money we'd spent for catering and photography, or because there were hundreds of people I'd have to face if I called it off, or because of any sort of hopeful romantic delusion. None of these things were even part of the story. It was because it seemed like a good idea at the time, which is how I wound up in this situation in the first place. I spent my late teens to late 20s floundering through serial monogamy. I'd alternate between falling head over heels in love and having my heart broken, then settling into comfortable, best friend style relationships. The burning, fiery connections were short term, acute. The only way I could manage a chronic condition was if there wasn't too much passion. It seemed like there was a causal relationship between chemistry and pain. After one final dramatic heartbreak, I was beaten down. I took a break from dating to lick my wounds, be single, and love myself. <laughs> That's what every self-help column and pop psychologist tells you to do, right? So when I met my future husband the following year, I was doing my best to avoid looking for love. I was dating again, but mostly focused on career and friends. We hung out for about <laughs> six months, before our friendship transitioned into romance. And our friendship was amazing. I absolutely adored him and could spend limitless time with him. It was a connection unlike any I had ever felt. So in the beginning, it was easy to ignore that there was something missing for me. After dating for about six months, I suggested we move in together. It seemed like a good idea at the time. We were spending most nights together, and the 20 minute drive between us was becoming a pain. Plus, think of all the money I'd save if I had someone to split the rent. Three years went by, and cohabitation was smooth sailing. I was climbing the corporate ladder and working on my bachelor's degree at night. Life was comfortable. We talked about our future and tossed around the idea of getting married someday. When I finished my degree at 31, my sights turned to grad school. A BS in sociology doesn't really unlock many doors. I'd always planned to move to the West Coast, and my boyfriend, ever supportive, was willing to go along for the ride and follow me across the country. It was decided. The acceptance letters came in, and I chose SDSU. In the middle of our moving sale, our apartment stacked with boxes and piles for strangers to pick through, I turned to my boyfriend and said, you know, if we're ever gonna get married, now is probably a good time. We'll be thousands of miles away from our families, so if anything happened to one of us, it would be really good if we were related. Not to mention <laughs> the tax breaks <laughs> and health insurance. He agreed, and so we were engaged. Then a neighbor came by and bought a magic bullet from us for $8. <laughs> we moved to San Diego in July. I started grad school in August, and in October, we got married. It was a small wedding with about 25 guests, mostly family. The ceremony was almost entirely in Hebrew, so I didn't know what was going on most of the time. I'm an atheist, as was my fiance, but our families aren't. In fact, his dad is a cantor. So we were married by my father-in-law, who belted out the Hebrew prayers at full volume on the beach in Coronado. <laughs> I never even said I do. But unlike Buttercup marrying Humperdinck, <laughs> I was indeed hitched at the end of the day. And throughout my wedding day, despite...
despite my conscious knowledge that it wasn't going to last, I went ahead with it. I chose to ignore the dynamics we'd created, me always pushing my agenda without giving much back, him building a defensive wall to protect himself from me, and the resentment bubbling under the surface. I stood... <laughs> I stood under the chuppah before our families, knowing it wasn't going to last, and went ahead with it anyway, because it seemed like a good idea at the time. I didn't realize until much, much later that this made me a huge asshole. <laughs> Married life was shockingly similar to unmarried life. He worked, I went to school. We bought a house. I had shit to do, and I was doing it, checking items off my list, accomplishing things, and all with a supportive best friend at my side. I knew our relationship wasn't thriving, but I was sure that would change once I was finished with grad school. Grad school was the problem, sucking up all my time and energy, keeping me up late at night, stressing me out, so stressed out that I never wanted to have sex. It was grad school. <laughs> and then I finished. Master's degree in hand, we went on vacation to celebrate. <laughs> Not only because I was finally a free woman, but because we had never even gone on a honeymoon. We deserved this trip. And Kauai was beautiful. If there was ever a place for us to reconnect and recommit to our life, life together, this was it. I wouldn't say we had a bad time in Hawaii, but I will say that when some paunchy middle-aged swingers got extremely friendly with us one night on a dinner cruise, I was more interested in what they had to offer than in bonding with my husband. For the record, 50-year-olds in puka shell necklaces and hedonism shirts aren't usually my type. <laughs> but in that moment, I welcomed any distraction from the person I was with. And then I got seasick, so nothing ever came of that encounter. <laughs> Over the next couple months, things deteriorated rapidly. My husband had been shut down for a while, and now, Without the veil of grad school, the holes in our marriage became more and more obvious to me. We were making each other miserable. My primary source of joy in life became binge-watching Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> and then Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I started to dream that an intensely passionate relationship like the one Buffy had with Spike could be <laughs> a reality for me too. This really should have been a wake up call, but I soldiered on for a while longer. When I had been married for two years to the day, I was in another wedding. As a bridesmaid, I listened to my brother and my sister-in-law exchange their vows. I saw the way they looked into each other's eyes, held on to each other, cried, as they tried to get the words out. And I thought about the last six months, the last two years, how unhappy I'd been, how what I had in my marriage looked absolutely nothing like what they had. And that was when the voice in my head shifted from, this is not going to last, to, I want a divorce. So I stood there crying, not sure if it was because I was happy for them or sad for me. After that, I demanded we go to marriage counseling. It was money well spent. It only took us five sessions to mutually agree that it was over and we both wanted out. I shudder to think how long it would have taken had we not had a therapist to help us get there. And counseling was great because it helped validate all my anger and my frustration. My husband had really ramped up his defenses, which to me felt like intentional, passive-aggressive torture. And our therapist agreed with me. <laughs> I had every right to be as upset as I was. 
And yet, at the same time, I started to realize I was the one who played the bigger part in creating this mess. What seemed like a good idea at the time, the boxes to check off, the milestones to accomplish, the pragmatic decisions, they allowed me to stick my head in the sand and neglect my partner's emotional needs, allowed me to not be vulnerable, allowed me to hide out in a comfy relationship where I loved him but wasn't in love with him. What a horrible thing to do to another person. By the time we got to counseling, he'd been angry and resentful toward me for years, and I had no idea because I was too self-absorbed, too afraid of any real emotional vulnerability to put myself in a situation where I had something to lose. I chose a partner who felt safe and in the process caused him immeasurable harm. Our divorce was quick and amicable. We even continued to live together for a couple years after we split. We'd always made much better friends than lovers. I would love to tell you that I am no longer an asshole. <laughs> that in the four and a half years since my marriage ended, I've grown as a person, romantically, emotionally, sexually, that I rarely beat myself up about it, that I don't constantly push for my own agenda, that even though I do fuck up sometimes, I've learned how to take other people's feelings into consideration and not treat them as a means to an end, that I've learned to be vulnerable and had my heart ripped out taken risks and gotten big rewards, had crazy, wild sexual adventures, found truly meaningful connections, and allowed myself to fall fully, deeply in love. And if I told you that, it would all be true. That's Vamp first-timer Kim Eisenberg. <laughs>